This is a glimpse into what I see when making a video. Well, okay, more accurately it's something like this, but we'll get into that later. The question I get asked the most is, how do I make my videos? The answer I always give is that I use DaVinci Resolve, which usually surprises people. Like really surprises people. Whilst it's a phenomenal free editing software, it's not exactly designed for mathematical animations. Well, at least at first glance. And that's what this video is for. Whilst my workflow isn't as powerful as many other tools, as a student my priority has always been time efficiency. I personally found that learning as much as I could about one software offered me more flexibility. So I just want to shed some light on how I use DaVinci Resolve to animate maths. In particular, we'll be working on creating this simple animation, which plots a graph. To get started, I'm just going to go through the basics of DaVinci Resolve. When you create a project, this is what you'll see. At the bottom, we have a bar with seven icons. You will probably spend 99% of your time within these two pages, the edit page and the fusion page. Inside the edit page, to create an animation, we need a fusion composition. All the videos I've worked on have been long sequences of these fusion compositions. By default, this will be five seconds long. So at 24 frames per second, this is 120 frames. Extend it so it's sufficiently long. I'm also going to add a track below this track and add the solid color background you see in all of my videos. Now we want to right click on the fusion composition and select Open in Fusion page. Here we'll be able to use these objects called nodes to create everything we see on screen. The animation we're working on has three key components. The coordinate grid, the curve, and the text. To get started, there is a dedicated grid node, but using it removes a lot of the flexibility we need when animating so we'll make the grid from scratch. A grid is effectively a bunch of duplicated horizontal and vertical lines. To create a single line, we first need a background node to give the color. Into the blue mask input, we can place a shape, in particular a polygon node. Inside of the preview window, we can draw a line, but we want to ensure that it's perfectly vertical. To do this, select the points, right click and hit publish points. What this does is it lets us access the coordinates of each point in the inspector panel on the right, so we can ensure the line is vertical. We can also change the thickness and the opacity of the line within the inspector window. Next, add a duplicate node. If we change the center and the number of copies, we can see that the vertical lines get duplicated. But we want these lines to fill the entire screen, and ideally, when we change the center, we don't want to manually have to change the number of copies. This is where expressions come in. You'll be using these a lot. All of these animations I've made relied on expressions of varying complexity. If you right click on any attribute in the inspector, you can add an expression, which can automatically update the attribute. The syntax is supposedly based on Lua, but I'd recommend reading the reference manual to learn the details. Now, in DaVinci Resolve, most nodes will vary their coordinates from 0 to 1. Well, emphasis on the most, as we'll see later. But in this case, that means that this expression will calculate the maximum number of copies we can fit on the screen, with the floor function rounding down to an integer. Now look, as we change the center, the number of copies automatically updates to fill the screen. We can repeat all of this for the horizontal lines too, but we want our grid to consist of squares. And ideally, if we make the horizontal spacing smaller, the vertical spacing should also get smaller. Again, we need an expression. Remember, the vertical coordinates also vary from 0 to 1, so if we just reference the x-coordinate of the center attribute in the first duplicate node in our second duplicate node, then we get these 16 by 9 rectangles, because of the aspect ratio of our video. Luckily, the fix is simple. We just need to multiply the offset in the y-coordinate by a factor of 16 over 9. 
Now everything works perfectly, we get a grid of squares. We can use this sort of idea to create lots of repeating grid patterns, like this, or like this. Next up, the two coordinate axes can be made in the exact same way, with a new, different coloured background node. And we can use the polygon tool to create this arrowhead shape. Finally, you guessed it, we need an expression to make sure that the tip of the arrowhead is at the end of each axis. So far we haven't done anything super special, but now we're going to plot a mathematical function. I spent a lot, and I mean a lot of time, finding weird workarounds for this, but in fact there's a purpose-built tool for this already. Again, we need another polygon. However, this time we're going to insert something called the Custom Poly Modifier. Inside the Modifiers tab, we can now adjust the resolution of the line and make the Y coordinate some function of the X coordinate. Remember I said that most nodes vary their coordinates from 0 to 1? Well, here the values of px and py vary from minus 0.5 to 0.5. Also, the expression syntax inside any custom node, for some reason, has a lot of really bizarre differences. Here are a few. As much as I love the software, I did have some sleepless nights, debugging the radians and degrees one. I'd again highly recommend you read the official reference manual to learn the syntax. With that said, you can input any function of px into the second input. Here are some examples. And we can use these numerical attributes to animate or modify the polyline expression. This tool is extremely powerful, and it's how I created this sinusoid and catenary curve in my video on infinitesimals. There was a bit more fiddling with if statements to restrict the region the line is plotted in, but honestly, I was just happy to get it working. But anyways, we're now ready to smoothly animate this all on screen. To the right of any attribute in the inspector is a small keyframing icon. This lets us set the value of each attribute at a particular point in time. To animate the horizontal grid lines on screen, we need to vary the position parameter from minus 1 to 0, say over 30 frames. Right now the animation isn't smooth, so this is where we need the spline editor. Here we can use these bezier handles to make the curve smooth. You'll likely need some trial and error before getting it to look right. This is something I've done thousands of times across my videos, so here are a few examples. Now, we want to animate the vertical lines in the same way, but with a small delay. And you know what that means, another expression. Each node has a getValue method, which lets us retrieve the value of another attribute at a certain point in time measured in frames. Time is a global variable storing the current frame number of the fusion composition. Notice the attribute name is right position, not just position, and that's because, annoyingly, the names displayed in the inspector aren't always the same as the variable names, which again cost me a few sleepless nights. But anyways, when all said and done, we get this nice animation. If you'd like, you can change the time offset attribute on the duplicate node to get a similar look to these animations from this video on polygons with integer vertices. We can use basically the same expression with a different time offset to animate the two coordinate axes, and we can animate the size of these arrowheads using the spine editor as we did before. You'll notice this is getting quite repetitive, and yep, we do the exact same thing to animate the curve drawing on screen. We already have quite a nice animation, the final thing to do is to add some text. Grab a text node from here. We can change the font, the colour, and the size within the first menu, but to format mathematical text, we need to be able to control each character individually. Right click on the text editor and select character level styling. Now in the modifiers panel we can highlight the text in the preview window, and then when we change anything in the inspector, it only gets applied to these characters. This is a tedious task, 
but we can go through and stylize each character into the desired font, size, and color. Finally, back outside of the modifiers panel, there are lots of tabs and attributes which I'd recommend you play around with. I personally like animating the size, but here are lots of different ways you can make the text appear on screen, so find something you like. For example, take a look at some of the different text animations I've played around with in my past videos. And we're done. What you'll find is that you won't use 90% of the tools inside of Fusion, but with just the techniques you learned today, like keyframing and expressions, you can take the animation we made and turn it into something like this. Unfortunately, I can't pack everything into a single video, and I avoided spending time focusing on small details, but I've created a Patreon where not only can you support me if you like my work, but as a bonus I plan to go more in depth into aspects like text, shapes, 3D, particles, and even scripting with Lua. All of these are techniques that I've used at various points on this channel. The first tutorials will be making their way very soon, and there I can spend more time on little things which I may have had to gloss over in this video. Even if you aren't interested, given that you've made it this far, I'd encourage you to at least look at some of the additional tiers and perks I have to offer. If you still don't find anything, I hope you found this video helpful. I don't normally ask, but I'd appreciate if you subscribed. The next videos will be just like normal, and I have some fairly ambitious projects scheduled for the near future.